السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. May the peace and blessings of the Almighty be upon every one of us, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings descend upon the entire earth, and may we see solutions to the problems that we face on the globe at large. We start off every time by saying Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. We praise the Almighty upon all conditions. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad, peace be upon him, all those who were sent by the Almighty to remove us from darkness, to bring us into the light. And we ask the Almighty to grant us all goodness and our offspring, those to come right up to the end. May the Almighty give us every form of goodness and protect us from evil. I mean, my brothers and sisters, they've put me in a spot and asked me to sing. Do I look like a singer? The brother who, what did you say? Subhanallah, I can't believe it. I actually speak. I am a motivational speaker, faith-based motivational speaker. So, inshallah, if you allow me to excuse myself from the singing, then perhaps I would get myself out of it. Am I excused? Okay, the sound guys, what I noticed is when brother Omar was here, there was different sound. I'm not a singer, but these guys are not excusing me. So are we going to get that sound? Are we going to get that sound inshallah? I hope it works. Okay, here it goes. So everyone who knows this, like I said, I'm not a singer. I don't know much, but inshallah, it's a beautiful occasion, something memorable. Let's go for it. First time we can break a little bit of history. Um, <clears throat> if you know what I'm about to sing, you can actually follow through with me. <coughs> See my throat. <coughs> Excuses, right? Tala al badru alayna min thaniyat al wada wajab al shukr alayna ma daa lillahi da. أيها المبعوث فينا جئت بالأمر المطاع جئت شرفت المدينة مرحبا يا خير داع ما شاء الله we did it الحمد لله ما شاء بارك الله فيكم my brothers and sisters, I was shaking and shivering. Mashallah. My heart is somewhere in my tongue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Okay, now let's get to what I'm used to all the time. So by the will of Allah, we just heard that Medina Munawwara was blessed with the coming of the greatest of creation, the most noble of all prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The excitement was tremendous. Here comes a leader into Medina Munawwara. There was a decision that was made by all the people of Medina to welcome this great man as their new leader. But there was a few or there were a few problems. One of them was just prior to the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, into Medina Munawwara, they were trying to appoint a leader and there was a man known as Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul who was in Medina Munawwara who wanted to become one of the leaders and he was almost appointed as a leader when everything was changed and the plan became such that Muhammad peace be upon him actually was now appointed the leader. So shaitan takes over sometimes, you know, when a different person is in position of power and authority, sometimes those who wanted that position become jealous. It happens in our workplaces. It happens in so many different settings. So he decided that because everyone is agreeing with this man and everyone wants him to be a leader, I am going to pretend like I like him. I'm going to pretend like I follow him and I'm going to make his mission difficult. But he did not know that he was going to be known as the head of the hypocrites. Ra'sul munafiqina fil Medina. The head of the hypocrites in Medina Munawwara. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul decided to pretend as though he was a Muslim, yet he was not. And he used to go to the Muslims who had accepted Islam and try and make them falter and make them think twice 
you know, you're accepting this man. Do you know what you're doing? There are too many rules, too many regulations. You have to give up so much of what you've been doing and so on. The same would happen to us today. If people accept Islam or people are considering following Islam, Shaitan will come to us. The devil comes to us and makes us think, you know, too many rules, too many regulations, too much to follow, too much to give up, too much to change, etc., etc. And as a result, we forget the bigger picture. So we need to realize every rule that we have is actually for our benefit. When Islam says intoxicants prohibited, it's in order to maximize the capacity of that brain of yours to ensure that it is never covered or blocked. You're a human being. You're not an animal. And if Islam says fornication, adultery is prohibited, it is in order to save you, your progeny, your offspring, your family members and community at large. If Islam tells you to dress in a modest way, it's in order to protect you, your family members, your community, etc., etc. All these rules, the benefit of these rules actually come back to us with positivity. But the devil keeps working on us. Losers are those who think that you know what all this is to our detriment yet they know subhanallah that it's actually to our favor i was speaking to a group of friends whom i'd grown up with and we met later on in life and they were telling me why do we have to meet at a coffee shop and i said because i don't want to meet at a pub or in a pub they say but what's wrong i say i've never drunk and you know what i don't drink you mean you've never tasted it i say not even not a drop well you don't know what you've missed out on subhanallah and then i tell them look at my eyes do you see a twinkle a sparkle doesn't it tell you i've never drunk not at all never ever and they say well that can happen with us too i said not really it depends how you look at it anyway that was a friendly discussion but the the, the, the point i'm raising is you don't miss out on anything. You actually feel so good about the fact that you've left something for the sake of Allah. And you know what? You've protected yourself. Someone was asking me this morning about smoking. And I told them, do you know what? It's a bad habit. Do you agree? They had to agree. Yes, it's a bad habit. Well, then leave it. Work on it. Come on. You know, we're brothers and sisters in faith. When we have bad habits, we will help each other to eradicate those bad habits. Now, let me take you back to the setting of Medina Munawwara. So here comes the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he enters Medina Munawwara. One of the first things he did was to build the Masjid. Al-Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina Munawwara. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to visit that masjid because the Prophet peace be upon him says Salatun fi masjidi hadha afdalu min alfi salatin fi ma siwa illa al masjid al haram One prayer that is fulfilled in this mosque of mine is better than a thousand prayers filled elsewhere or fulfilled elsewhere besides al masjid al haram <coughs> So he built this masjid it brought together the Muslimin my brothers who are out here today and my sisters as well, how many of us are concerned about the affairs of our neighbors, our community members and so on. The brothers, you have an opportunity five times a day to meet with each other in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem is we hardly attend. You find Salatul Jum'ah, everyone is there. And Salatul Asr on the same day of Jum'ah, the masjid has one saf, as though it's a different sort of Allah that we are praying to when it comes to Jum'ah and Salatul Asr on the same day, meaning the late afternoon prayer. So importance has been given to the places of worship by Islam because they bring together community, society, the Ummah in a way that there is no virtue of the wealthy over those who are poor, those who are dark in complexion over those who are light, those who perhaps are powerful in society over those who might not be so powerful, those who have menial jobs, etc., etc. Everyone is equal completely. You and I know when you enter the masjid, the serenity that you feel, the calmness that you feel, because it's the house of Allah. It does not belong to the Imam, nor does it belong to the committee, but it belongs to Allah. They're only fulfilling a duty. And this was taught to us by Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the beginning. The masjid has been given importance. He came in and he made sure that Bilal ibn Rabah from Africa, who was there in Medina, was the one who would call the call to prayer. 
and he would also be standing in the line exactly same line as those who were wealthy whether they were from the muhajirin or the ansar and for the benefit of those who might not know the muhajirin were those who were driven out of their homes from mecca by the disbelievers of quraish and the ansar were those who were in medina munawwara who were ready to help those who had come from mecca to mukarramah those were the ansar they were based in medina they opened their homes and it brings me to another delicate aspect that was dealt with by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam right at the beginning. So many people, so many thousands had come from Mecca being driven out of their homes into Medina Munawwara. Nobody built refugee camps for them. Nobody told them we will put tents in the corner there. They came to people who only shared La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. They came to people who they did not know before that. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, told them, each one of you take into your house one family. They become brothers and you become part of the same family. That's difficult. Many of us today, when visitors are visiting us from our own cousins, from our relatives, we say we're not at home and we are at home. Wow. Wow. I remember meeting someone who told me, yeah, you're right, but you know, home is my bed. So I was not on my bed at the time. And I'm like excuses once again, subhanallah. We have become less hospitable to the degree that we feel agitated when we are told that you're going to be having visitors and guests. Whereas at that time, they considered it an honor. When visitors did not visit them, they felt something was wrong and amiss. Will we change? Will we go back to the original teachings and become happy, hospitable once again? Become people who can interact. May Allah make it easy for all of us. I'm standing here talking to you, thinking to myself, I also need that message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me a reminder before everyone else. Amen. So they took in these muhajireen who had come from Mecca and it was known as al muakha al muakha meaning the fostering of a relationship of brotherhood between two people who were not related for a particular purpose at the time of the hijrah of the muhajireen from Mecca to the Ansar in Medina Munawwara. Wow, that's the explanation of this term al muakha if we look at the crises today across the globe, we have people who are struggling. Not only would we not be able to take them into our homes and houses, but many of us have not reached into our pockets to give them even a single real or a dollar. I think we should be considering donating something. And when we donate, we donate through the correct channels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. My brothers and sisters, many are struggling and suffering across the globe as we speak. It would be wrong for us to be speaking about the suffering of the Muslimin at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, without drawing a lesson from there, bringing it to us, reminding us we need to reach out as well. Not everyone is able to reach out in the same way. Some of us, it might only be through dua and prayer, but don't think that that's enough and that will suffice on its own. When the Almighty has given you the capacity to do something, you need to make sure together with that dua, together with the supplication, you will also do something within your capacity, even if it means putting your hands into your pockets and taking something out, even if it was one coin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Amen. So I seize a moment to ask the Almighty and I want you to say Ameen. May the Almighty grant ease to all those who are suffering and struggling across the globe. My brothers and sisters, they welcomed their brothers from Mecca to Mukarramah. They opened their homes. They were hospitable. But the Muhajireen were not lazy. The people who came in from Mecca, they were not lazy. Look at the examples of people like Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu an. He was a businessman in Mecca. His wealth was usurped. Everything was taken by the people of Mecca. They were made to leave Mecca to Mukarramah without their property, without their wealth, without anything. They just took whatever they could, a little bit of it, and they rushed to Medina Munawwara. Abdurrahman ibn Awf says, Show me where, where the market is. 
This was the first day he arrived. So he was shown where the market was. That evening he came back with a profit. Meaning he had a little bit of excess in terms of wealth. How many of us are that dedicated in business? May Allah give us barakah and blessings. Where there is a will, there is a way. Don't wait for handouts, but try to work. Ask Allah's help. Seek the help of the Almighty. And work hard. Be dedicated. You come out in the morning. You may return in the evening with something small. But the fact that you tried and it was your perspiration, your sweat, there will be blessings in that income that you have. So they were not lazy. That's another lesson we learn. Every one of us. Yes, we may have jobs. We may be looking for jobs. Keep looking. Don't give up. Don't give up. The day you give up, that's the day your door closes. For as long as you continue trying and for as long as you have hope, even if it takes years, your doors remain open. Remember that. People say, well, I'm sitting at home making dua. And I tell them, you know, when you want to eat, what do you do? You go to the kitchen. And or you sit down with the food and you take it and you put it into your mouth. You don't just look at the burger in the advert and say, Bismillah, may this burger come to my mouth. Oh Allah, I believe in you. No. By the way, can you see I'm affected by the singing that I sang right at the beginning? May Allah forgive me. Okay. So we know that someone would take such a person to the mental hospital. Because you're crazy looking at Arab and say, Ya Allah, I believe in you. And I'm, I want you to let this burger come into my mouth. I am a good mu'min. And Allah says, I gave you the energy. I gave you the capacity. You have to get up. You have to walk out. You have to go and earn. Then you will go. You will go to the place where you get this burger. And nowadays you're lucky. You can phone. You can actually have it on the internet. They will deliver it to you. But you need to open the door, collect it, make the payment, do whatever you have to and put it in your mouth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May our burgers always taste nice. I mean. So my brothers and sisters, that's a reality. Laziness has overtaken us to the degree that we want everything on the plate. And you know what? As a result, we're becoming unhealthy because the Almighty's plan is that if you're, you, if you're utilizing the energy we've given you, you will be healthy. And if you're letting it sit, you're going to be unhealthy to say the least. So therefore, make sure that you use what the Almighty has bestowed you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that ability. Amen. The Muhajireen then became quite wealthy. Some of them were known as some of the wealthiest of the lot. Uthman ibn Affan was from the Muhajireen. He was wealthy. Abdurrahman ibn Auf was very wealthy. And they became wealthy in a very short space of time. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right at the beginning, had another delicate matter to deal with. What was it? In Medina Munawwara, there were Christians and Jews. They were not just Muslims. They were Christians and Jews as well. And they were in Medina. What did he do? He struck an agreement with them. He declared to them that we will fulfill all your rights. You will be able to practice your faith and you will fulfill all our rights as well. If we're attacked collectively, we will all defend Medina collectively. Where are those who say that, you know what? You're supposed to distance yourself from the Jews and the Christians. That is actually not true, but rather it's not got to do with the religion that you follow. It's got to do with the person. It's got to do with that person. If the person is not good, even if they're Muslim, you have to stay away from them. If there is a Muslim who is bad company, bad habits, turning you away from Allah, they have enmity that they've shown to you. It would be in the best of your interest to stay away from them. The same would apply if there was anyone else of any other faith. What is of relevance is how good they are, how much they respect you and you respect them. And this is why the Quran makes it very, very clear that those whom we prohibit you from getting very close to are those who have harmed you. They have come to fight you. They have driven you out of your homes and they have assisted others to harm you. You would be foolish if you befriended those. But as for those who fulfill your rights, they respect you. They have always maintained that mutual respect for them. We have not stopped you from befriending them. Not only that, even marrying them. Subhanallah. Under certain circumstances, even that marriage between the Muslims and the people of the book is permissible. 
So this was a treaty that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had struck with the Jews and the Christians of Medina Munawwara fulfilling their rights. And on top of that, the different tribes of Medina Munawwara who had entered Islam, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, had enshrined within that agreement that each one should respect the other and each one should defend the other and we're all brothers and we all have equal rights and this is how it should be my brothers and sisters today with a small difference that we have amongst the sects of the muslimin we tend to have more hatred than any love that exists we tend to have such hatred that is very, very detrimental, very dangerous for the ummah itself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a beautiful lesson. We will have differences. We will discuss those differences. We will present evidences. Those who are passionate about another view will present their evidences. Ultimately, we may agree to disagree at the end if we have not come on to the same opinion because we are just human. But in the same way, I am passionate about what I believe is correct. I have to understand the others have a right to believe that what they have is absolutely correct as well. They have the same right. I'm passionate about what I follow. They are passionate about what they follow. Neither of us can think that the other one does not have a right to exist because Allah made them in the first place. If Allah wanted, he wouldn't have made them, but Allah made all the other creatures. And that's a point that we need to understand. We were made by Allah. The non-Muslims were made by Allah. The Christians were made by Allah. The atheists were made by Allah. The Satanists were made by Allah all for a reason. I believe I'm right. I believe I have Tawheed. I believe I, in the oneness of the Almighty. And part of my duty is to keep on conveying the message. From among those who don't believe, they might see the light. And from among those, they might not see the light. <laughs> You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not guide whomsoever you wish. But we are the ones, Allah is the one who guides. You can only show the path. Whether or not they follow the path is in the hands of the Almighty because the hearts belong to Allah. My brothers and sisters, as we move further, we see upon that agreement there was calm in Medina. It was a period of growth. And this shows us that when we have a good understanding with those whom we live with, we will have a period of growth. I want to pause for a moment and tell you, my brothers and sisters, a lesson that I learn, you should learn within your houses, within the nuclear family, going on to the extended families, have a good understanding, live and let live for the sake of Allah. Many people do not get along with their own family members. Why? Because each one wants to impose his own understanding upon the other. A lot of the times people just sit and dish instructions to those whom they are not supposed to dish those instructions to. A lot of you are fortunate you're living in Qatar, subhanallah, far away from your mother-in-law. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I see the laugh was, at least you took it well. But those mother-in-laws are brilliant, aren't they? Lovely people, they're far away. I'm talking about those who live together. The closer you are in proximity, physically, sometimes the greater the misunderstandings. I am one of those who promotes letting your children who are married live separately from you because the more distant they are physically, the closer they will be from their hearts. I witnessed it with my own eyes. Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy for us to fulfill the rights of our parents. May Allah make it easy for us to fulfill the rights of one another. Here is a beautiful scenario in Medina Munawwara. Something that we sit and read all the time, but drawing lessons from it is not everybody's job. Not everyone is good at drawing lessons from what you read. A lot of us read a story and we're happy about reading it. But would you draw lessons from it? The Prophet Sallallahu was faced with more challenges. What was the other challenge? The people of Mecca were not happy that the Muslimin had a base in Medina Munawwara. 
they had already stolen the property of the Muslims. They had already stolen not only the immovable, but the movable property as well. And they had persecuted and even killed a few in Mecca to Mukarramah. Now that these people were going away, it was not sufficient. They decided we need to attack. We need to do. They began to plan and Allah kept the messenger peace be upon him notified regarding their plans. So he knew until one day the prophet peace be upon him heard something. He heard about a caravan of Abu Sufyan that had gone to the Syrian peninsula in order to do business. And it was coming back, returning, passing through a place not too far off from Medina Munawwara. So the Muslims decided, you know what? The wealth that is being used by Abu Sufyan and the Kuffar of Mecca, the disbelievers of Mecca, is our wealth. They usurped our wealth. They took it. Now they're going to Asham in order to do business with our money. So it's our, it's our right to go and get that caravan and we're going to get our wealth back. So they decided, let's make a group of us and we will go. The group was approximately 313 men. Not heavily armed because that caravan was not such a big caravan. And so what happened is as they went out, someone sent news to Abu Sufyan to say these people are coming out to attack this caravan. Was it justified? The answer was yes, it was. Because imagine a thief takes a million dollars of yours and you, you get news that that thief is going to be around the corner. It's your right to go and try and get hold of the thief and take your money back. So the Muslimin were just doing that. But as a result, Abu Sufyan changed his path and he decided to go to Makkah from a different route. So the Muslims kept following, following, following until they got to a place known as Badr. By that time, the, the people of Makkah had sent more assistance back up and they came up with a thousand men to fight the Muslims. Subhanallah. A battle took place. The first battle, decisive battle, the battle of Badr. The Muslims were not ready for it. They did not go for a battle. They went for a little caravan. My brothers and sisters, sometimes in our lives, we don't plan things. We, in our small plans, would like to execute something, whereas the Almighty has a bigger plan for us. Use your capacity to do what is beneficial for you. What the Almighty has planned is something far greater. Sometimes you end up coming to a country like this. May Allah bless this beautiful nation. I mean, sometimes you end up coming to a country like this with a plan of having a certain job. And when you come here, the Almighty opens so many doors that you didn't even imagine. How did that happen? It was the plan of the Almighty. And you may not have initially been, been through that which was rosy. It wasn't rosy all along, but there was a time when you saw the fruit of it that it made you smile. It made you so happy. This happens. The Prophet wasallam had not intended to fight Quraysh, but Quraysh came out and they were convinced that we're going to beat the Muslims today, the day of Badr. And the Muslims decided, you know what? We're not even heavily armed. We didn't even come here to fight a war, but we have to do this. You know what was Allah's plan? The thousand strong men who came from Makkah to fight the Muslims were drinking all night and dancing through the night and spending the night in entertainment because they knew they were going to overcome the Muslims. But because they had drunk so much, like I told you, I've never even tasted alcohol, so I wouldn't know what it feels like. But they say, the following morning, you, you're still a little bit tipsy, right? You're still like sort of tossing and turning. You can still see two guys when there's only one. Okay, so the following morning, they were half still in their state. And the war began. No sooner did the war begin than it ended. It was so quick because the Muslims were so small in number. Less than a third, they overcame the disbelievers or the enemy they overcame them and that was such a victory that the people of Makkah were embarrassed embarrassed how many times the Almighty has told us that 
those who seem so powerful are actually very weak very weak and sometimes those whom we look at as very weak they are extremely powerful but that's all in the hands of the Almighty may the Almighty grant us all victory over the devil to begin with over our bad habits as well because many of us are big mashallah size six-pack you know we were talking about the Sheikh Abdul Rahim was asking about how many packs you have six pack and he says put up your hands and we didn't see any hands because it was dark just as well and i was going to say brother we have one family pack alhamdulillah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease that having been said you see powerful people big muscles you know with that uh, t-shirt halfway up the muscle to show you how heavily you know protein they are mashallah tabarakallah and guess what I've said it before, I say it again. They cannot lift the blanket for Salatul Fajr. They can't just, it needs one ba baby finger. They can't do that. Why? That's the weakness. You can be as burly as you want. That's not power. The power is when you know what to do and what not to do. Subhanallah. Some of the most beautiful people on earth have never been to the gym. <laughs> Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. I see you were not too impressed with that because perhaps everyone loves the gym. I'm not saying don't be healthy. I am saying and I did say it's important to take care of your health. But you need to ask yourself, I am so healthy, alhamdulillah. I thank Allah. But what am I doing for preparation for that day when I'm going to be buried and all that health would mean zero? I need to do some good deeds while I'm alive so that I have a good hereafter. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, faced another battle. That was the battle of Uhud after the battle of Badr. And after that battle, he faced another battle. And that was the battle of Al-Ahzab, where the alliances were made on the other side. And they came in large numbers. And it was almost impossible to defend Medina. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, being a messenger of the Almighty, was instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek the opinions of his companions did he need it no he did not need it but he was instructed to do it to teach us a lesson seek advice seek the opinions of those around you who are genuine sincere and qualified in the field that you want the advice in you have your family members many people tell me i want to get married but my mother is saying no because the guy is a bit too dark I promise you someone else says I want to get married but you know my father is saying no because the guy is from a slightly different financial background someone says you know we want to get married but both our parents are so difficult what would, can what can you do about it so we address the parents to say try and understand you have children they are an amana a trust entrusted to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them to marry the easier you make for them to get married the more blessed the union shall be but my beloved children who are here your parents are not fools who need to be ignored sometimes what they are saying a lot of the times what they are saying is valid sometimes they're giving you advice to say hang on this is a big mistake man so Try to seek advice and guidance from those around you who mean the most to you. I know of a person who fought a battle with their parents in order to marry a specific person and ultimately won the battle. And the parents said, okay, we're not happy, but anyway, we will just do it. A year later, this lady comes crying to say, I should have listened to my father. This guy is a totally different guy. And I said to her, you know what? It's still not too late. It's still not too late. Subhanallah. Obviously, the problem was huge. The problem was very big and it was not identified initially because you see, initially, shaitan, the devil beautifies that which is prohibited, right? So things that are not good appear to be good because he wants you to sin. Once everything is okay and halal, shaitan does the opposite. He wants you to fight with your spouse because he knows if the relationship here is broken or is bad, you're going to end up going elsewhere, seeking attention from someone else and that's going to kindle a wrong relationship. So shaitan benefits from that. So you have to make an effort to develop your relationships. 
But the point I'm raising is seeking advice, guidance. The Prophet ﷺ sought the guidance of all his companions. There was one Salman al Farisi from Persia who was not even from Mecca. He was an outsider, a foreigner. He was not even from Medina. He said, you know, back there, we used to dig trenches around the cities to prevent the enemy from coming in. And the Prophet ﷺ says, we're going to do that. And that's what they did. So it, there was a trench that was dug around most of Medina where it would have been possible for the enemy to enter from. And the enemy came, they saw a big trench and they were taken aback. And they camped on the other side of the trench, hoping that they're going to go in once they can. But Allah sends the weather. The weather, very bad weather. The storm came in, the winds came. And the enemy had to go back and retreat. And in that way, the battle of Ahzab was actually won. So these were the challenges faced by Muhammad and his companions. In the battle of Uhud, you look at a man like Musab ibn Umair, radiallahu an, he lost his life. Why did they fight? In order to survive, in order to be able to take this deen in such a way that today it has gotten to yourselves and myself. Had they given up and said, that's it. Where would the deen have gone? And that's why on the day of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, with me are all these people, 313. If you would like to be worshipped on earth, grant us victory. Subhanallah. Their aim was that people needed to worship Allah alone. They were granted that victory. Let's move further. I'm not able to cover every aspect like we did yesterday. I'm not able to cover every single aspect of the seerah, but I want to draw lessons. We have the Prophet ﷺ in Medina Munawwara. What a great man. He lived with his family members in a way that everyone watched what he did and what he said. He had his grandson, Al Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu an, and he once kissed him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, in Medina Munawwara, is kissing his son. And a, comp and a man is sitting near him. And he says, How can you kiss that son of yours? Grandson, sorry, it's a grandson. How can you kiss this grandson of yours? I have 10. I've never kissed even one. Al-Aqra ibn Habis, right, later to be known as radiallahu an. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Man la yarham, la yurham. Whoever doesn't show mercy will not be shown mercy. To kiss your children, your grandchildren, your family members is a sign of mercy. You love them. If you're not going to be merciful towards your children, your family members, how will you achieve the mercy of the most merciful? And that's why in another narration, the Prophet peace be upon him says, man fil ardi man fil sama. Have mercy upon those on earth and the one in the heavens will have mercy upon you. Not only mercy upon your own children and your family members, Although charity definitely begins at home, but go beyond that. Have mercy upon every one and all the creatures of the Almighty on this earth, and the Almighty will have mercy on you. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was faced with a great challenge. His companions told him, We are on the straight path. We want to go to Mecca in order to fulfill the pilgrimage. And he says, let's go to Mecca to fulfill the pilgrimage. He had seen a dream. Some of the companions had seen a dream, etc. So much had happened in a nutshell. They decided we are going to go unarmed. We're not going to fight. We're going to Mecca and, and we want to fulfill the pilgrimage. So the Prophet wasallam took his companions. They decided to march on to Mecca. When they got to a place known as Hudaybiyah, imagine they were ready to fulfill the pilgrimage. Imagine they were ready to fulfill the Umrah. They were ready to fulfill Umrah. 
When we say pilgrimage, there are two things we refer to, the minor and the major. The major is hajj and the minor is the pilgrimage known as the umrah. And what happened? My brothers and sisters, what I said yesterday and what I'm saying today, every sentence has in it lessons for all of us. It's up to us to derive these lessons and to try and put them into our lives. I use the word current ties, bring it into the current day in your own life. So as they went, they arrived at Al Hudaybiyah. They sent a delegation into Mecca to tell them that we have arrived. We don't intend to harm you. We don't want to fight you. We don't want you to politicize this entire thing here. All we need to do is to go in there, make the Umrah and come out. That's all we want. We want no harm. We want nothing more, nothing less. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was one of those who was sent to go in. When he went in, there was a rumor that spread that they had killed him. When that rumor spread, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, you know what? We have to pledge here under this tree that even though we are unarmed, we are going to go into Makkah in order to revenge the blood of our brother. And they all pledged allegiance that for justice, we don't mind losing our lives. It's amazing how that dedication was recognized by the Almighty. And Allah says, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا Allah became pleased with those who pledged the allegiance with you under that tree. And Allah knew and recognized what was in their hearts. So he converted that feeling into a beautiful peace, into a serenity. And he gave glad tidings of a victory that was to come. What was that victory? Number one, Allah is saying, I'm happy with you. I'm pleased with you. You decided to defend one another. How many of us are ready to defend one another? You want to earn the pleasure of the Almighty. Learn to be the best neighbor. Learn to be the best of the family members. Learn to be the best of the community. Learn to serve people. Learn to reach out to people. Learn to help people. And that's when you will achieve victory. You will achieve calmness the happiness of the almighty with us we are still struggling with jealousy malice envy hatred etc etc we need to work on our own hearts to eradicate these bad habits before we can even inch forward may allah make it easy for us to eradicate these habits so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was told Later on, that okay, this man was not killed. He emerged. They all sighed, a sigh of relief, and they thanked Allah. But they were told, you're not allowed to go into Mecca right now. You guys go back. How can we go back? We came here for Umrah. You want to chase us back? They were told, yes, you got to go back. You can come back next year. But why? What did we do? No one could explain. They said, we, you go back. As a result, they struck an agreement. What was the agreement? A peace treaty. We're going to make peace between the two sides. We've been at war for too long. We've had so many skirmishes and battles, and we need to put aside all of this. We need to now strike this agreement. That agreement was so one-sided, so one-sided. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted to make peace. So he says, it's okay. They said, if anyone from amongst you comes to us, we're going to keep them. But if anyone from us comes to you, you send them back. It's so unfair. The Prophet ﷺ says, okay. That's just one example. I'm not even going to go into all the details. My time is actually running out. But my brothers and sisters, when that treaty was signed and they were going back and they agreed that we're not going to be fighting no more wars, nothing's going to be happening for the next 10 years. Some of the companions looked at the Prophet, peace be upon him, and they were so, so unhappy with the fact that they could not make the Umrah. And they were asking, 
Allah's revealing verses saying, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We have indeed granted you a clear victory. What type of victory is this? We're going back without Umrah. We've just made a treaty that sounds so one-sided. What type of a victory is the Byzantians and to Africa and everywhere else? And some accepted Islam while the others may not have accepted, but the message got to them. Had they been engaged in this little petty war between themselves, it would have never spread. My brothers and sisters, I pause for a moment. A nation only grows during a time of peace. Stability, security, togetherness, unity. That's when you grow. The minute there are cracks, how will we grow? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. We need to hold together. We need to be determined. We need to have the focus, the hope in the mercy of the Almighty. We need to be able to endure the rough days because the days of ease are right ahead. Every one of us, myself included, we have had, will have, perhaps do have rough days, days that are tough, as dark as the darkest hour of the night. But guess what? Immediately after that hour, you will notice a crack of dawn. Subhanallah. No matter what problem you're going through, the Almighty is watching. He's all able, all capable. The crack of dawn shall emerge when you really think this is the darkest hour, but you are filled with faith and conviction in the Almighty. So there came a day when the people of Mecca broke the agreement. They broke the agreement. When they broke that agreement, by that time the Muslims were beyond a hundred thousand strong men. Agreement was broken by the people of Mecca. Prophet peace be upon him sent message to say that treaty we signed some years ago, no longer applicable, nothing. Zero broken. They began, they took all their men and they marched on to Mecca to Mukarrama. They marched on to Mecca. Just the numbers had already made the people of Mecca worried. These Muslims in such a short space of time, they've expanded and they've grown. That was the help of Allah. How many of us in our own little lives? Let me give you a financial example. How many of us in our own little lives? We have financial difficulty. We have issues. We wouldn't believe that one a day will come when we will have so much of wealth. We won't know what to do with it. Subhanallah. But the Lord is capable. Allah is all able. He can sort your problems out. That is why. It is sad to see those who are seeking sustenance through the disobedience of the owner of sustenance. The one who owns your wealth and your sustenance, the one who is the provider, you can never ever get and achieve sustenance through the disobedience of the same maker who owns all of that. So the Prophet ﷺ was granted a beautiful victory. They marched onto Mecca. To who? To the people who had killed them, persecuted them, prepared armies to fight them. The people who had already massacred so many of them, stolen their property and their wealth, both immovable and movable property. And here comes the man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whom Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And indeed, we have not sent you except as a source of total mercy to the alameen, to all those of all the times who shall dwell on the earth. Amazing. He walks into Mecca to Mukarrama and I'm cutting this short. He walks into Mecca to Mukarrama and already he had met one of the leaders, Abu Sufyan himself. And Abu Sufyan, there were so many incidents. Inshallah, perhaps if we have this seerah, convention next year here in Doha, we will perhaps discuss different aspects of the seerah and draw more lessons. Abu Sufyan had decided to enter the fold of Islam. At a certain point, the Prophet peace be upon him, got into Mecca, 
at that stage, the victory was for him, for Islam, for the Muslims. He was so humble. He was looking down. He was on his camel. He had his head put right down near the neck of the camel. He did not want to be up. I'm today the king here. No, not like that. No way. But rather humble humility. We're not here to prove a point. We're here to serve the almighty. We want to see justice. So he made an announcement. Whoever goes into the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Whoever puts their weapons down will not be attacked. Whoever goes into the haram, into the place of worship, not to be attacked. Whoever enters their own houses won't be attacked. Whoever turns away, not going to be attacked. And almost everyone actually did that. Until he gathered them when they entered Mecca and he gathered them all around. Everyone was around. Who? The enemies. There was no war. It was just the victory of Makkah. They marched into Makkah. Victory after how many years? Two decades. Subhanallah. Two decades of suffering. How many of us are prepared to endure two decades of suffering? Not one. Not one. But the most beloved unto Allah endured that for 20 odd years. And he was happy. He was always content. That is life. Life is a struggle, my brothers and sisters. If you think it's going to be a garden of roses, remember, there will always be more thorns than roses in that garden. It's up to you to appreciate the roses while carefully protecting yourself from the thorns. So my brothers and sisters, here comes Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Ya ma'shara Quraysh, ma'dha tadunnuna anni fa'ilum bikum. O people of Quraysh, what do you think I'm going to do to you today? Now, obviously, what must be going through their minds is, you know what? We killed them. We harmed them. We drove them out of Mecca. We took their wealth. We took their property. We boycotted them. We stopped them from Umrah. We did this to them. We sent armies and so on and so forth. And they're like looking at him and like they're hoping, you know, you're a good man. You know, now you're a good man, isn't it? Ah, mashallah. Every time you want something from someone, hey, you're a good man. <laughs> The moment you don't need that, that guy, be careful. <laughs> Subhanallah. That's the attitude we have, right? So they're looking at the Prophet ﷺ. You're a good man. He says, I want to tell you. You know, he could have done anything. He could have called them all and said, right guys, here goes. All of you are going to be executed. He could have said that. He didn't. I'm going to tell you what the Prophet Joseph, may peace be upon him, told his brothers. No retribution against you today. Go. All of you are free. We've forgiven you. Wow. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. This depicted the victory of Mecca. My brothers, my sisters, when you are powerful, a sign of true power is when you can forgive people. When you cannot forgive, you are weak very weak when you can forgive you are powerful so much so that the most forgiving is the most powerful and who is that it's Allah I am constantly forgiving those who seek forgiveness Allah says Allah doesn't call himself Ghafoor alone, but he adds another name, Ghaffar, one who forgives all the time. People ask, well, I committed a sin, I sought forgiveness, now I fell back into the sin. I say, seek forgiveness again, and if I fall again, again, and if you fall again, again, until you really appreciate the forgiveness of Allah. But when you sought that forgiveness, be genuine. So my brothers and sisters, we've heard a few of the lessons from the Medina period. Just a few. I was given 45 minutes to speak. Today, I overshot. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. I'm really, really keen. I'm really, really interested in listening to the next lecture that is about to be delivered regarding the final moments of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it always brings tears to my eyes. So I'd like to leave this podium reminding one and all 
to just remain where you are. I'm just going to be seated right there to listen to the rest of this beautiful, beautiful man who was sent to us to remove us from the darkness, to bring us to the light. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we are to study his life truly and correctly with the intention of putting it into practice, we would actually become the best of people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all good lesson. May we be able to forgive our own brothers and sisters who have wronged us. May we be able to forgive the community members and others who may have wronged us. May Allah strengthen us all and as a result, may he be